this game. Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval themed format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you. Yes, you the person who is just so absolutely loving how ridiculously wet and damp it is here in the UK. I, seriously, sodden spirits. Sodden, I tell you. Sodden. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than... Blake Lewis 5173, which implies that there are 5,172 other Blake Lewises out there, but you, my friend, you are my favourite because you have suggested that I cover this week on Choose Your Own Adventure pre-internet video games that would have been dramatically better had they been able to patch themselves. Oh boy, oh baby. And this is the thing, when it comes to the modern era of gaming, it's kind of a double-edged sword affair, because on the one hand, we're able to pull games from the ether via downloads and enjoy cinematic experiences that blast through our screens in dizzying resolutions, but on the other hand, we're often viewed by publishers as greasy little piggy banks just waiting to be smashed open via microtransactions and season passes. We have never been treated better, and also we have never been treated worse. But at least our games actually work. But there is an asterisk on the end of that. At least our games work eventually because we're able to patch them, to update them via hotfixes and download huge, girthy day one patches in order to right the wrongs that the developers have just been going, nope, the, the, ooh, when you press start, the console shouldn't explode. That I'm pretty sure should not happen. However, back in the day, we didn't have such luxury. You got whatever was printed to a disc or cartridge and that was it. If it was broken upon release, then it was bloody well gonna stay that way. But what if we could go back in time and fix some of the greatest errors of our youth? What if we could turn some absolute stinkers into stonkers? Well, James, that's what we're going to be doing today in this after the lengthy intro right here, because I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight broken pre-internet video games that desperately needed a patch. Oh, and by the way, there is going to be a few entries on this list where the internet technically was invented, but wasn't used as a means of downloading patches here. So just, just work with me on this one, please. Please, come on, guys. Oh, yeah, also. Number eight, The Lion King on the Schneers. Now, I know this sentence might sound like complete and utter hyperbole, but... The Lion King for the Schneiers is the game that ruined my childhood. I say this because thanks to this utter hellscape of a title, I got to see my dad utterly defeated and on the brink of such anger that he had to walk away from the console entirely. It was one of those glass-shattering moments, because up until that point, my parents were kind of like superheroes in my eyes, always there to offer help or assistance, and to see him unable to get past some of the early levels of this game was, well, utterly gutting for both he and I. And you know what? It didn't have to be this way, because this wasn't some sort of perceived difficulty where I and my dad weren't just good enough at the game in order to beat it. No, it was actually a mandated one by Disney themselves, who told Capcom to basically make the game so difficult that it couldn't actually be beaten in a single rental period, thus spiking their sales through the roof. The the greasy, oily Probably gonna have to, um, probably gonna have to actually, uh, censor now, because of the YouTube new laws. Enjoy that, James. Therefore, my patch would not only be one that introduced a more lenient difficulty mode, but would also act as a salve to my and many other gamers' earliest gaming experiences. I had a funny thought, actually, when you just think of, like, if it was actually that traumatising, just sat on a couch speaking to your therapist about it. It's like, so, what really is bothering you? Yes, I'm going for the kind of, like, um, Germanized Sigmund Freud affair here, so. Yes, so what is bothering you here? It's the Lion King for the Schneers. Number seven, Jack X Combat Racing. Now this next entry genuinely pains me to talk about, because when discussing the best kart racing games, and say it with me, James of all time, I feel that there are a few that get unfairly overlooked. I mean, why is nobody talking about speed freaks? Why is nobody talking about the little scrap rocket that is Jack X Combat Racing? Well, fret not, my friend, because I'm here to talk about it now. 
and how it almost uh, bricked your entire console. Now, I always felt that this game was like the little engine that could, that smashed onto the scene with an unrefined experience and often wonky gameplay, but without a care in the world. And because of this confidence and surprisingly engaging narrative became a regular on my tell everyone at school about list. However, much less appealing than the vehicular combat on offer was the sheer destructive power that this game could do to your PS2, as if you owned a slim PS2 and tried to play Jack X for some some unknown reason the game would, without warning, corrupt your save file entirely. And I don't just mean the game data here, I mean the actual save file itself. Yeah, you couldn't actually delete it. That was the problem. So it was corrupted, but the game would try and load it each and every time that you put in the disk, even if you made a brand new save file. Yay! <laughs> so in order to convert the masses onto this overlooked little clunker, I definitely sought a patch out for this if I had the power to do so. Number six, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for the Game Boy. Now here's the thing, when it comes to Legend of Zelda games, they are, more often than not, absolute love letters to the adventure genre, and so are made with a huge amount of time and care. As such, the majority of Zelda titles hit the market with little to no bugs in them and are rightly championed as a result. However, I know at this point that the more sardonic of you are likely going to be cracking your knuckles and ready to fire up the keyboards with messages such as, Oh, well, Jules, have you ever seen the Philips CDI monstrosities? Or have you played Zelda 2? It's absolute garbage. Well, you know what, friends? You're right. You're absolutely right. Those games are probably the weaker, weaker end of the Legend of Zelda franchise. But unfortunately, not one single patch will fix whatever the hell's going on with them. I mean, just bring up any clip, James, of any of the Philips CDI, uh, CGI moment that's there. Ooh, that's gross. What about this one? What is that? Rubies, really? Rupees, you idiot. And so we must turn to Link's Awakening for the Game Boy, an utterly brilliant title full of charm, oddity, and with the added bonus of being able to play it on the bus into school. Yet for all of the fun frolicking taking place in this game, there existed a rather nasty bug that was utterly crying out for a patch, and it all centred around the purchase of a second shovel. Now I know that this might not seem like a big deal. Ooh, you bought an item, again, after you've traded it away for a boomerang and replaced it. Oh no! But the problem is, is that this invention that you use in the game is well, very specific to say the least because it had exactly one slot available for every key item in the game. So if you trade away your shovel for a boomerang then buy another one to replace that slot, well uh oh, you just locked yourself out from picking up a key item in the game. And the game will not tell you that you've made this mistake so you'll reach the final moment and be like, I can't pick up the magic MacGuffin, the magic kazoo of Kalamamoo. Why can't I pick it up? It's slipping through my greasy fingers. So yeah, big uh-ohs all around, and I hope that you're going to enjoy restarting your adventure. In short, this needed to be patched. Number five, Robocop for the Commodore 64. So for our next entry, we venture over to the world of Guru Larry, or as he would say, hello you. He's a wondrously entertaining content creator who has a wealth of knowledge on video games, and more importantly, very interesting facts and scandalous secrets about your favorite titles, and whilst perusing one of his older videos, I was reminded of the horror show that was Robocop for the Commodore 64. Now at this point in time when the game was released, Robocop was a white-hot property, shifting merchandise by the truckload and selling out of toys quicker than you could say, I'd buy that for a dollar. And in the rarest of examples, nearly every version of the Robocop tie-in video game was met with rave reviews. But you see, nearly is the key word here. That was because the Commodore 64 port of the game was an absolute steaming pile of crude oil and insipid laziness. Here the game was actually remade from the ground up, and it turns out that the devs encountered a glitch that caused the graphics past level 4 to glitch out into an incomprehensible mess. Yet rather than put the hours in to try and, you know, fix the bug, they decided for a very, um, well, I won't say clever, and I won't say inspired, what I will say is entirely evil choice of making sure that the level before this was so ridiculously difficult that it was technically impossible to beat. They just basically were like, there's a bug there, should we fix it? I've got tickets to the rugby, mate. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll just make the level before so impossible, no one can beat it, who the hell's gonna care? It's just kids, <laughs> it's just kids, right? It's just a video game, right? It's just a thing that you've paid for. Monsters, animals, heathens. If this game was properly fixed or patched, then Robocop might have achieved the perfect home run of well-reviewed console releases, but the Commodore 64 scuppered all hopes of this. 
Boo. The crowd hates this. Boo. Number 4. Wipeout for the PC Now, it may seem very strange for younger viewers in the audience watching what appears to them to be a colourful bin hovering above the floor to the sounds of electronica long since forgotten, but there was a time where the Wipeout franchise was the low-key king of futuristic racing games. Reality was out of the window with this title, as was much of the gravity, and players around the world flocked towards this techno-drenched marvel to experience its thumping soundtrack, wonderful track design, and aesthetics that hit with a perfect, grimy Blade Runner sweet spot. I realise as I read that out, Blade Runner is already pretty grimy, but just a little, 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 little bit of gravel on top. Like Salt Bay. Is that how he does it? I don't even know. How does he do it? He's not Spider-Man. As word of mouth and positive reviews spread, it seemed like this franchise was set in stone with the first game Wipeout 2097. However, the PC port of the game, titled Wipeout XL, dropped like such a lead balloon that it almost cracked the foundation forever. For you see, in the weirdest bug that I have ever heard of, this game would actually run faster depending on how good your PC was. Now, for fans of F-Zero, this sounds like a dream come true, as after all, outside of the bedroom, faster is always better, right? Well, remember, kids, speed kills. And because there was no cap on how fast this game could run in comparison to how good your hardware was, it made the game literally unplayable within a few years. Seriously, it was blindingly quick. And I know that there might be some of you out there saying, well, surely this got patched, right? Well, yes, it did. However, the game's patch required you to mess with the game's code and for some reason didn't even work half the time. Cheers for that. And so we have the odd case of a game being too wild to tame even by the devs and a whole PC audience unable to enjoy the game that they paid for. So yeah, patch this. Number three, Soul Calibur 3. Now, when it comes to discussing the best fighting games ever, I feel like the Soul Calibur franchise often gets left out of the conversation. Yes, Tekken is utterly sublime, and yes, Street Fighter VI might well be my most anticipated game of this year, but do these games let you batter your opponent with a sword the size of a school bus or distract your opponent with impossible jiggle physics? No, they don't! So let's talk about Soul Calibur. And I tell you what, Soul Calibur 3 was a rather beautiful beast indeed, refining a ton of gameplay elements from SC2, offering up brand new characters whilst being unafraid to do away with the old, and even offering up a brand new gameplay mode that acted as a pseudo-RPG add-on called Chronicles of the Sword mode. Yet for all of these brilliant additions, there was one rather horrible takeaway that came in the form of punishing the player for playing anything else other than Soul Calibur 3. Confused? Well, of course you too would be if you went into your memory card, decided to do a bit of spring cleaning, maybe copy, move, delete some old game data out of there, went back to Soul Calibur 3 and found that all of your Chronicles of the Sword mode had been deleted. What? How? Why? <laughs> yeah, that's fun to have all of your progress in this lengthy mode removed entirely because you decided to, I don't know, dust up your memory card once in a while. This desperately needed a fix. Number two, all of Action 52. Ah, <sighs> just saying the name Action 52 is likely to cause a shiver to run through the spine of many a gamer, because this was the video game package that was too good to be true, and unfortunately left a legacy so utterly stinky that I can still smell it today. No, nope, that's just me, actually. Now, rather than being just a standalone title, Action 52 sold itself as an anthology of games containing, you guessed it, 15 games! What's that, James? You thought that there was going to be 52 games on this? Well, technically there are, mate, but only 15 of them f work. Yes, for a svelte $200 back in 1991, you'd be able to slog your way through a mangled mess of titles, some of which were direct rip-offs of much better games, or just sit staring at a screen as the data failed to load anything. But the cream of the absolute crap has to be the game that developers Active Enterprises truly wanted to turn into a franchise, and that was... Cheetah Man. This was meant to be the devs' attempt at a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles adjacent series, but things kinda stopped dead in their tracks thanks to the game being utterly broken and unfinished. One can only assume that the other 51 titles included were to make Cheetah Man look better by comparison, but unfortunately the only Cheetah gamers were truly feeling at this point was being cheated by this game's criminal quality. Therefore, I propose that we travel back in time to patch Action 52, not just to fix Cheetah Men to apply fixes to the litany of bugs on offer here, but also to add in an ending to this game, because you just end up shooting this absolute burk of a vulture, and it just goes like, oh, 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 I'm dead, back to the title screen. Wasn't that fun, but also to patch the rest of the game out of existence. 
and it should just be the cheetah man everything else done and also lower the price point as a result with each one that we delete so yeah at best you're paying for a less than mediocre title but at least you're not paying 200 bloody dollary dues for it and number one pac-man for the atari 2600 so while the history books will often point the gnarled finger of retribution at et for atari as being the game that sunk the hms good vibes and gesture to the mass grave in the mexican desert as proof of an industry trying to bury their sins let's not forget that it wasn't actually the first stone cast at the gaming industry in its formative years no that dishonor belongs to pac-man for the atari 2600 which was a game that was so horribly rushed botched and callously splattered onto the gaming market that it irreparably damaged the relationship between gamers and publishers at large while there were many less than acceptable titles circulating at the time of pac-man's atari port this was the game that burned the franchise the most as it traded on the unprecedented success of the arcade original and delivered such slop that the game's box should have come with a biohazard warning from a horrendous flickering effect that came from the game being poorly optimized for the console to the atrocious graphics and rather limp sound this is quite possibly the worst port in existence yet had the sole developer been given more time and atari been more conscientious to their consumer maybe a patched or a revised version of this game could have saved public perception of the industry at large in short if patches had existed back then and was applied to pac-man for the atari 2600 we might not have had the great video game crash of the 1980s Imagine where we would have been without that hard reset. And there we go, my friends. Those were eight broken pre-internet video games that desperately needed a patch. I hope that you enjoyed that. And please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. And pop your suggestions for next week's episode down there as well. If you want to chat to James Dowes and I on the social medias, you can do so over here. I wonder what delicious meme he's put up for this week. Who knows? Who knows? I could be gesturing to myself or my bike like he put in last week, you cheeky little man, you. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. I hope that you treat yourself well, my friend friend because you know what it is never too late to apply a patch or a hot fix to our own lives to take a step back realize what isn't working and see whether or not we need to ask for help and there is no shame in that my friends asking for help is sometimes the best thing that you can do because a problem shared is a problem solved a hell of a lot quicker so remember be kind to yourself give yourself a break from time to time and just remember above all else you're a massive ledge and you deserve the best as always i've been jules you have been awesome never forget that and i'll speak to you soon Bye.